I've been getting out of my comfort zone the whole time and saying yes to everything to the point where there is no comfort zone anymore. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set. Lots of folks have reached out and asked us to put the show on Spotify. And because Spotify has strict rules regarding the use of music in podcasts, this week we'll experiment with omitting any music from the show. Let us know what you think. My guest this week is drummer Jason Sutter. Jason has a command of the craft that has enabled him to thrive as the drummer for artists such as Marilyn Manson, Joe Perry, Foreigner, and the New York Dolls. Jason grew up in upstate New York, but I coincidentally met him back in the 80s because he happened to be friends with my next-door neighbor in Milwaukee. Jason goes out on tour with Cher beginning this month, and we spoke in downtown Los Angeles last year. And now my conversation with Jason Sutter. My dad was a sculptor at the university. He was a professor of drawing and, and sculpture at... Potsdam State College there. And that was a SUNY, SUNY college, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, my mother was a nurse there. And oh, cool. My mom's a nurse, too. Yeah. So that was cool. You know, we grew up in that kind of campus environment. All the kids in my high school, even though it was a lot of farmland and farmers, and it was, you know, beautiful. We grew up on a river, beautiful river, uh, the Racket River that came from the St. Lawrence River from Canada. We were minutes from Canada, which was fun to kind of be kind of a, grow up in that crossing a border like it was nothing, you know, to go get Chinese food. We can get Chinese food and where we grew up, where we were, we'd cross the border in 20 minutes and we'd have food or dinner and exotic you know, different foods and go to Montreal. And it was like, when I finally got to Paris, you know, my twenties, I was like, Oh, I grew up right next to this. It was called Montreal. You yeah. Know? It is weird. Like when you're crossing the border and driving into Quebec, it really does feel like you're in the French countryside. Oh, you are. Oh, oh no. I see what you mean. Yeah, 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 definitely. Definitely. It's really has that feeling, even the everything about it, the landscape and obviously the people and the food, obviously it's a twisted French version, but it's, it's very cool. I mean, and I, I'm fortunate. I got a uh, Shea 106 was the radio station I could pick up. And I always think it's funny because when you hear Neil Peart get interviewed, he, he grew up in St. Catherine, in right nearby, and he could only get American stations where he was. He was just far enough away from Montreal where I grew up. I could only get Canadian radio stations. So I grew up hearing a lot of Canadian music as well as as rock. You know, it was a great radio station. But so you were listening to like. Uh, Gordon Lightfoot and Anne Murray and people oh, like that. Well, that, but it were also it was like mostly rock. So it was like Led Zeppelin. It was it was. But then there were bands like yeah, sure, like the Guess Kim Who? Mitchell. Oh yeah, Kim Mitchell or like oh, loads or like Lena Lovitch or like really weird like Canadian bands that I think she's Canadian or like artsy and Canadian and hip like Saga. Mm -hmm. You know, like Saga who ripped, you mm -hmm. know, and I just thought Saga was everywhere and they were international. They had a couple of hits, but I learned, I grew up listening to like when I toured co with Chris Cornell with Pete Thorne, who's from Edmonton, we could sit in, on tour in Canada and listen in a bar at night. We just like, I knew all the tunes we'd crack up because we knew all the same music because I grew up with that. So it was kind of cool. I have a little Canadian connection. So I always joke, I, I speak fluent Canadian. Would your dad listen to music while he was sculpting? He did all the time, and it was cool shit. It was like Pink Floyd, like when The Wall came out. That was like in high rotation. Or he bought like Santana Z-Bop and then decided that wasn't cool enough for him and gave it to me. <laughs> yeah. And I love that record to this day because I, I was like eight or nine, so to me it was cool as hell. And it actually, in a weird way, influenced as a drummer. When I was at North Texas, you hear guys come in and say, well, you could never play Latin music unless you grew up listening to it. It's like, I kind of did. Not just from Z-Bop, but I got into the whole Santana thing when I was like nine or ten and bought every record. And yeah, maybe it's not like, you know, Mongo Santa, Santeria or whatever his name Santa is. Maria, Santa Maria, yeah. But it's just pre pretty legit dope percussion on those records, especially the deep cuts. Mm -hmm. So he hit me to a lot of stuff. He was very hip. He gave me my first stereo. Mike Shreve talked into that microphone that Dude, you're talking into. Mike Shreve <laughs> is, is, is the best. He's a huge, I'm a huge fan. For a while, we did a, we did a clinic in... And we did Woodstick in uh, Seattle, and he was sat right next to me, and he came up to me, and he came to my, I did a little brush clinic, and he came up, and we became pals by the end, and I'm a huge Mike Tree fan, and I laid a pair of sticks, he was like, what are those sticks, I'm trying not to, I laid my sticks on him, and he wrote me, and was like, dude, I'm only using your sticks now. When did you start playing music? I first wanted to get, play drums, I, I stressed interest, I think it was like four or five in my name, my 
a neighbor gave them some drum, a friend of ours, a professor, gave them a snare drum that their son had discarded years ago. And I kind of got that going and then broke the drum head. And then they, I started studying drums. And the, there's a kind of an interesting story, but my dad w w was always wanted to play drums. He always wanted to be a musician, but he grew up in Milwaukee. His, his father was the chief of police in Milwaukee in the 60s, um, Joe Sutter. Uh, and and that, I should mention that's how we know each other yeah. because I grew up in Milwaukee and I'm friends with your cousin Matt. Yeah, and we were like basically walking by your house to go like cross the right. We'd walk down to get into the woods. Like yes, your house was near. I remember. I don't know if you were. I, I I'm gonna say that you must have been part of the cruise during the summers I when I was a little kid in my backyard, trying to go play guitar with with Matt and his friends, and everybody was smoking weed. Yeah. And like playing Grateful Dead songs yeah. badly on a, an acoustic guitar. <laughs> I was around. Yeah. I know all was, what's really beautiful about the, that scene that was in you know Glenview Avenue, right over there in Wauwatosa. And I, my grandmother lived there, so that's why my mother's mother, my grandmother, Mimi, um, lived there. So we would just hang in that cool cul-de-sac you guys lived in, and there was a shortcut that would take you into the woods where you could smoke pot or hang out or whatever. And um, we, I remember, it's crazy, it's all the musicians that Matt was playing with back then, I'm still friends with, you know what I mean? We still see each other and they have families and they still play music and it's like, we've known each other forever, you know? And you and I have literally crossed paths since mm -hmm. we were like 25 years ago or something insane. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. That was a very idyllic area, obviously you probably agree. And it was a really beautiful time for me growing up in the summers, we'd go to Milwaukee because that's where my parents met. So my dad was... Uh, always wanted to play drums, but his dad was chief of police, and that was not going to happen. The only reason my but dad, he became a sculptor because he got scholarship to Marquette. Okay, and my dad, my my grandfather couldn't argue with that. He got a full ride because he was, you know, he was really good, and he got a full ride to all his college. He went to like you know three major universities, so he was able to kind of break that mold. But he did have to serve. He did have to serve in the police academy. He and my uncle. Um, my uncle's a couple years older than my dad. My uncle, Joe Sutter II, became the chief of police of Milwaukee, Milwaukee during the Dahmer, that whole thing. All through the 70s was my uncle in 80s. And he retired a little while ago. But So I, he was there. He, he was, saw all he that shit. there, man. He was in the middle of all that shit. <laughs> my uncle was a, a reporter for the CBS affiliate in Milwaukee and was, I think, the only television reporter allowed in the courtroom. And he said it haunted his dreams for years. Oh, sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's really bizarre. My dad used to get ambrosia chocolate, you know? Right, and which is, for people that don't know, it was the chocolate factory where Dahmer worked. And once the word got out, he ate people and things. So once the word got out, they closed the Ambrosia factory. Sad, you know? So it was that influential, you know, that big of a deal. And tragic overall, obviously. But, um, but yeah, so my dad was able to kind of break out of that. So when I stressed interest in taking, I started getting drum lessons, my dad, you know, showed up that day with like a bag of mallets and drumsticks and everything you, books you needed to start drumming. I was probably seven or eight. And I was taking lessons. And the coolest thing that could have happened is, the drum teacher that was friends with my dad, they were about the same age, still are, and uh, was Jim Peterzak. And Jim Peterzak taught at Crane School of Music, but was from, grew up in, in, in Long Island, New York, uh, New Jersey, kind of both, and would gig around that area, but he taught in Potsdam. So he was able to have a great life and a beautiful home on the water like ours, and he taught at the college. So when my dad said that I was interested, he said, well, you know, I'll give him lessons. And so the coolest thing is my father traded a drawing, a big giant drawing for drum lessons for me to Peter Zach. So I got to get drum lessons from him with an art transaction with one of the, what turned out to be one of the best, you know, technicians and educators in the world it was Jim Peter Zach, who went on to teach a young Dave Weckl from when Dave was like 11 till he was like 16, you know? And he cites him for in his early videos of Jim Peter Zach's technique. And then later Vinny came to st all the way to Potsdam to study with Jim Peter Zach. So it's like kind of dope. And Peter Zach's still in the game. He is at every NAM and every PASIC as a educator. He was the president of PAS when I was studying with him. So I got kind of been brought into that world and also just music school in general. You know, I'd show up at the college to a pretty killer music school called Crane School of Music. A lot of great, Musicians came from there, and educators went on to teach. And so I had that kind of academic environment early on. Did you take guys. to it right away? I don't know. I, 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 it was kind of foreign, and I was more interested in just gigging. But we did start gigging pretty quick. I was probably, by the time I was 11, I was making 
six, seven bucks a dance, and we were playing three sets of music with a band. We had a roadie. Our parents had to drive us to the gigs. I was the youngest. I was 11, and the other guys were, I was like nine, I was like 10 and 11, and the other guys were probably like 12, 13. And we were gigging. I have pictures. I had a little Ludwig kid. There were girls. We were getting paid. We were, you know, kind of like, you know, it was heavy. It was cool. So I can honestly say I don't remember a time before I was playing drums of some sort. I can't remember before that. So it was always part of who I was. And even in like a little baby book, when I'm in like third or fourth grade, it says, you know, I want to grow up. I want to be a, you know, the year before is like archaeologist. The next year is like fourth grade. I want to be a rock star. And literally mm -hmm. every year after. And by eighth grade, and seventh grade, eighth grade, I, by, by sixth grade, I had played my first gig. Did those types of gigs feel like a cathartic release or was it like working? It was just fun. Yeah. Yeah. There was nothing, nothing had, had nothing to do with money or, you know, a, meeting some cute girl. That was kind of cool to be able to play at a dance at a different high school and go like, wow, I get to meet this girl, Jenny, whatever her name is. Cause I'd never meet her before and I never would meet her if I wasn't playing at her high school. And the only way to meet, hang at her high school, unless I'm playing on the football team, which I had no interest in doing was to play drums at for a dance. And what better way to meet, Jenny, whoever that is, than playing a gig at her high school, you know, mm -hmm. or grade school. When you said that you wanted to be a rock star in fourth grade, what did that mean? Like, what was what were you picturing in your mind? Oh, it was easy. I mean, I, I wasn't just picturing it. I drew it next to it. I drew what Matt did and probably what you did, what Matt had in his little basement. You remember Matt had a little drum set? I had drawings all around of, like, a double bass kit, light show. I knew how many strings there were in a guitar. I knew 20 different guitars I could draw. I had, I had immersed myself in that rock and roll world because we were. I mean, it's weird to think of. I remember hearing rocks. My older cousin, Joey... Um, when he, were you born? The late '60s? Yeah, '69. Okay, pretty so, much everybody that's been on this show that <laughs> yeah, no, it's a comes weird, from that generation. Weird? I'm I'm a little bit old, younger than yeah. you guys, so it wasn't as big for me. But yes, we all have that syntax. Kiss was our yeah. bible. We got it was a great time. Like I, how many people would say that you listen to a classic like Aerosmith rocks? I remember my cousin getting it. We sat there, and I was a little baby, and then these guys were like 15, 17, and they put on rocks, and I heard the sound wash over me fresh like the day it came out like that's crazy to think about so i kind of was in the bridge the gap of like kind of you know hearing like you know seals and crofts singing summer breeze or right. or redbone come and get your love like that's my earliest mu music i could hear in like 1970 71 i remember that and how it felt and it was mm -hmm. like i like this you know mm -hmm. i like this i want I, something about this i can relate to and then aerosmith and kiss that shit hit like a, you know, like a brick wall. And it was like, oh, yeah. And then literally I got my first stereo the day, the day Bonham died. My dad gave In me a stereo. Yeah. Yeah. And he gave me, like, I had a little stereo before, but he gave me a real stereo. So all I, I did is, all they did is played Led Zeppelin for about two months on Shea 106. So I just recorded on a tape every day. So I had, I had every Led Zeppelin everything by the time I was like a lat 10, you know? And the wall came out and all that shit. It was just like such a great time for music. And I know Matt was doing the same thing. Matt, my cousin, Matt Liven, is a fantastic drummer. We know him and we refer to him. But he and I, he's a year younger than me, was living in Milwaukee. And we were playing, at the, started playing at the same time. He was starting to gig, um, maybe a little after me as far as gigs. And he was taking some lessons. But, but his dad was a famous harmonica player. My uncle is Jim Liven, who played with... Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and the Violent Femmes and Johnny Winter and still is he still works all the still time killing top notch as you know and you know harmonica player you know I, when we were on tour with 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 uh, Blues Traveler with Smash Mouth when we were rolling into town we had four days off and I just mentioned to Popper that my uncle and he was like what your uncle's Jim Liban I, can I meet him I'm like yeah John Popper best harmonica player ever you know and we ended up doing a jam and this you can find it on youtube john popper and jim liban at some bar uh and we play like a bl slow blues and they they trade off for like it's like a 10 minute long thing it's pretty amazing you know so you were surrounded by people that were making a living as musicians from a young age and as artists i mean you had your father who was making uh, his life in visual arts and then your teacher and everybody else on the faculty and then your uncle. And so did it seem like something that would be easy to do? 
Absolutely, and they were super obviously supportive. My dad would. My dad was to the point of almost. You know, he's a perfectionist. You know, he went to college with Chuck Close. They were best friends in Amherst. Um, you know, we're talking about the high level of these of art. He he never paid for college. He was 100% dedicated. He made art at night, taught during the day, still showed in Manhattan. Um, it was a high level. So to him, if you're going to do something like this, you're either going to do it really well or don't do it at all. Mm -hmm. So he was supportive, but at the same time, you know, you're taking lessons with Jim Peterzak. You're doing this. This is very real. It was very real to me that this was, but also the enjoyment I was getting out of playing gigs and getting better was obviously I was driven, but it was also I had to keep up with my lessons, you know, and he was very serious about that. So I, they were supportive, which is a great thing. Yes. And then after high school, you went on to UNT? I did. And how did that change your outlook? I mean, it just blew my doors wide open. I mean, it was terrifying. First of all, I was basically deficient in everything, I didn't, you know, compared to the level of quality of players. But the way University of North Texas, then it was actually North Texas State for about a year while I was there. The way that school worked is they would let, like, everybody in. And then by the first semester, like, put it this way, about, I think there were 75 new drummers. And that means grad students, undergrad, transfer 75, by the next semester, there were probably 50 left. And by, when I graduated, I graduated 13 people total for percussion. And that was double the amount of drummers who graduate normally from that school. Normally, it's about five people graduate a year as percussionists because it's just, it's brutal. You can't, you know, you don't just play drum set. In fact, I hardly played drum set. Luckily, I had done so much drum set and had so much experience in high school playing with all these different bands. I was playing in five bands at one point, you know, and I was always a little kid. And I was playing with the, the, the cover band that were all college kids playing like missing persons and pretenders and cool college stuff, playing beer blasts. And I was playing with the blues band with like the dudes with the cigarettes sticking out of their mouth, like my uncle's band, some dark blues club, like yelling at me, like, stop dragging, you know, more <laughs> left hand, you know, like getting my ass kicked, like real <laughs> shit that you hear about. And then I would be playing with a pop band, you know, that was like, I had Simmons drums and Rototoms and we had our own PA and light show and that would be three nights a week. So I was literally kind of freelancing at a young age. I was dealing with contracts, booking these bands at other high schools and, and getting real life experience that would later come to benefit me. It was like I would find myself in real professional situations when I was in my 30s and playing gigs and go like, wait, I've been here before. It was like, oh yeah, that was that time when I had to deal with this in high school. You know what I mean? So it was great. It was a great experience. When I got to college, I had all that experience that no one had. Even if they came from LA or New York or wherever, they didn't have any of that knowledge that professional playing experience, I had the grease, you know? I had all these years of playing professional situations with a bunch of different bands, not just one. So when I got there, I put all that on the side. I didn't play drum set for my first two years. I studied timpani. I learned how to play marimba well. I joined the drum line. I had never had a marching band in my high school. I played cymbals my first year, and that was terrifying. I almost got cut from that. Jim Riley was playing top bass drum. We were freshmen, we were roommates. It was the Rascal Flats drummer. It was like we got our asses handed to us. It was terrifying. I slept very little. I lost chunks of hair out of nerves. It was terrifying. I was like hanging by the seat of my pants. And then this after. Do you my, think that was the best way to learn? Absolutely. Yeah. It was. It was. It was definitely. Now I can look back. Harnessing fear. <laughs> fear and just like. Every, every moment was a challenge, and they mm -hmm. made it that way. Dr. Shatroma, Robert Shatroma, the head of the program, made it that way, you know? That said, Ed Sof came in my first year, and luckily he and Peter Zach, I had seen him do a clinic, which kind of was the first time I went like, wow, brushes, awesome. And he did a clinic at Potsdam State for Yamaha, which Peter Zach was as well. He came to, to North Texas the same year I did. And Peter Zach did me a solid, I guess I had a little bit of like, you know, that kind of whatever payola or whatever. Peter Zach reached out to him without me asking and said, hey, Ed, I know you're going to North Texas. I know you're probably only going to teach the upperclassmen. Do me a favor and teach this kid. He's a student of mine. Just throw me out. I was like, sure. So when Ed showed up to Dr. Shatroma, he said, I got to do one thing. I, I got to teach this underclassman. And I don't know how that went over because you don't tell Shatroma stuff like that, but he said so. Next thing you know, I'm registered and I'm a, I have to study snare drum. I'm not studying drum set. So my first lessons with Ed Sof are snare drum. And I can probably say I'm probably one of the only students who got to study snare drum with Ed Sof, which is pretty dope because I'd roll and we're doing Wilcoxon's swing solos mm -hmm. and he pulls out his Cooperman marching sticks and Ed Sof gets all swanky. And it was just like, this is pretty dope. 
So I got to study with Ed Sof the entire five years I was at North Texas, which was pretty great. And then after you left Denton, you went to Miami, right? I did, because my dad and I had basically a deal. My dad early on, you know, like I said, was pretty tough and pretty intense, and he's collegiate, and he went through all these schooling, and he never paid for it. So his thing was, you know, if you're going to go to college, and you're not on scholarship, and you're going for the arts, maybe you're not good enough, you know? Maybe you're not cut out for it, you know? If you're not able to, like, so that was a lot of pressure. And my freshman year, I didn't have a scholarship because I applied for the wrong thing. I applied for like jazz instead of trying to do a more broad. But either way, I, was, I wasn't ready. Even though I was studied, I had killer hands. I can say I had killer hands thanks to Peter Zach. I could read. I could play well. But I wasn't ready for that collegiate world. Even though I had studied a little marimba, I wasn't ready for that. You know, I didn't have a drum line. So I was literally, it was like baptism by fire. I didn't sleep, you know? I was wherever I could, I would get with the upperclassmen and be like, dude, show me how to play like a flam drag right, or show me the interp. And they would sit with me at North Texas. It was a very communal, wonderful environment. The second semester, I got called in off the marching field. Doc wants to see you and Greg Beck. And then we were just like, oh, shit. Like, you don't want to see Doc. You know, you're just terrified of him. He was just like, it was whiplash, but in a great way, you know? And the dudes who deserved the yelling and screaming and would, would be crying, deserved it because he cared about them but it was brutal things chairs thrown in rehearsals it was full-on whiplash and anybody who went to north texas will tell you that was real it wasn't even remotely in fact that what happened at north texas made that shit look like a joke right i'm not kidding like chasing dudes around marimbas like i'm gonna you know like but it was all for the best if you can believe that so when we got called in it was terrifying and doc we walked into his office and he said neither of you guys are on scholarship i believe you should be have your parents contribute 100 bucks to the scholarship fund. You'll be on scholarship next year because you deserve it. You earned it. We walked out of there like tears, crying. It was like finally a moment like, no, you're, you're going to be able to do this. You're actually going to be able to hang, and this dude believes in you, and he called you off the field and is offering you scholarships. That doesn't happen that often. So that was a really big deal. I went from, you know, it, it made all that sleepless nights and, you know, it made it worth it. It was like, this dude kind of believes in us, you know? So that was a cool moment. And so my father had always, so I got a scholarship for the rest of my time I was at North Texas, which is amazing. And my father, so that was part of the deal with my dad. You know, it was like, see, look, I got a scholarship. The other part was, I have to go to grad school. Just promise me you'll go to grad school and then you can go do whatever you want. Because he knew that undergrad is not enough and I'm glad he made me do that, you know? So I went to undergrad, University of North Texas was music education. I had to teach kids and do all that classic, you know, education, you know, as well as- Do you like teaching kids? Not at all. I, have no, I had no interest in teaching at all. Even then I thought I did and I taught drum lines, you know, and stuff, it was fun. I didn't want to do that, I never did. You know, I just kind of, it seemed like a really good solid degree and I had basic liberal arts, science, math, so I could always go do something else if that changed. It's also the only music degree that you can get that has a practical right. use. In absolutely. The, in the real world. <laughs> exactly. So Although that, if you, you know, that's not to say that if you're, if you'd rather be playing gigs uh -huh. and you're, you know, begrudgingly teaching kids, then you're not doing them any service exactly. either. You know, so. And I learned that early on, which is why I just bagged that. But, and so then I went to University of Miami for orchestral study of orchestral percussion was the degree. Cause I thought, well, I've got this and this will look strong and it's stronger than a jazz major. And I was, I got a full assistantship and I got paid cause it's a kind of a private school. It's a good school. And my goal was to go there. I could teach the drum line. That's what I'd be doing for the hurricane drum line, which is, you know, the hurricane football team was like, Major, you know, bowl games, loads of money, Nike sponsored. So I was like, cool. I'll, and I'll also play in a jazz band. I'll also do these other things. And, and so that was the point of going there. And I had to get a legit degree. So I studied legit percussion. And that was cool. It was great. But I ended up taking over the percussion department, basically. The professor there was about to retire. And he was like, do you guys want to do this? I brought, I was able to have an assistant. I brought my friend Kim Berger, who's also from North Texas. And we literally said yes, and we took over the percussion department. So by my, by my second semester there, we were literally picking the repertoire for the percussion concerts and doing it like a mini North Texas, teaching all the methods classes. It was great. It was really great. It was like, we really, you know, it was like professor. And that taught me, like, I don't want to do that but I got a taste of teaching on a collegiate level. It was cool, but I was still, the eye was on, on the prize. What was the prize? Playing, doing what I'm doing now. It was always playing pop, rock, something. Could have been jazz. I have no idea. I was prepared to try to do everything, 
you know? The big band, the CJB I was playing in there was literally Maynard Ferguson, or not, yeah, Maynard Ferguson's big band. Mm -hmm. We had just ended for like a long ter term, and they all came to Miami to finish their degrees. And half of them like, are teaching, are Roger Ingram, Dante Luciani, the top cat. So I'm playing in a big band with Dennis Marks, the band. At the time, it was uh, Jeff Babco playing yeah. in the big band. He was obviously Jimmy Kimmel and top piano player maybe in the world, one of the top guys. Super proud of him. He, we were in the big band together. And a great guitarist named John Kreisberg, who uh, has a wonderful guitar career on Blue Note Records in New York. And, you know, so it was really a great time and loads of great drummers that I could, too many to mention here at both schools, you know, from Keith Carlock at North Texas to um, Kevin Stevens and uh, Eric Gardner and a load of drummers from Miami, you know, that were there. So many cats who went on, Brendan Buckley. You know, yep. we were all there. So that the best thing about college in general for me, people can talk as much shit about college in the real world, is the networking I made, you know, and how that later, you know, the first guy I met when I was here, I went, I was playing with Jason Faulkner, and Jeff Babco comes up afterwards and was like, what are you doing here? We're playing together. I have a pop band. You're going to play in it. Okay. You know what I mean? It was like instant, you know? That pop band is now the band on Jimmy Kimmel, you know? I'm not doing it, obviously, because I went off and did other things but anyway that, that was the goal was to get out and rock and um that kind of happened you know? how did it happen well a buddy of mine dave gibbs who uh lives out here uh is a great friend he was in a band called the gigolo ants from potsdam his dad was a professor at the music school taught trumpet he went to boston and was working in boston like post well like grunge 90s early 90s right when i was about to graduate from undergrad um and he was, you know, we, we'd see each other at Christmas at this bar called Maxfields. And, and right as I was in my, starting my final semester at Miami in January, I basically, he said, um, dude, you should come to Boston. You play just like this kid named Stacy Jones, who's Stacy Jones, who plays with Miley Cyrus, yeah. MD, incredible drummer. He was the guitarist and singer of American Hi-Fi that I played drums in as well, you know, back in... 2004 and five so and we've been best friends but he said you look and play just like him and i'm like you haven't seen me play since i was 17 i've literally that was seven years ago and i've been playing in big bands and tim and orchestras he's like no trust me you'd be perfect everybody wants this guy to play in their bands and he has a band called letters to cleo so he can't do so he actually went to bat he's very very resourceful dave gibbs and we now own a wine bar together in in north hollywood uh, pretty funny called, you do called mirabelle yeah Dave owns like four restaurants now and is a place with Tom Morello, plays bass, and we go all the way back. We played in Greece. We started Rock of Ages together. We literally arranged the music, and Dave kept going, and Rock of Ages became one of the biggest Broadway hits. We literally played in Greece in high school. You know what I mean? It's kind of crazy. So Dave got the management to fly me up, and I flew up, and I auditioned for Tracy Bonham and Juliana Hatfield, both who had record deals, and were about to have a new record cycle and I got the gig with Juliana and I went back to Miami and said to Gary Green my professor and what do I do he said go do it just make sure you come back and do this recital all I had left to do luckily was a, a master's recital orchestral timpani percussion marimba so I went and did the gig and it was amazing literally like three weeks after I left uh, you know one minute I'm in college and the next minute I leave at the beginning of the semester and I'm playing on the Conan O'Brien show and everybody at college does a big party and they're watching me play on Conan which was a big deal back then yeah it so, was for my generation yes. like cause I'm about 10 years younger than you and so all through high school I was watching that everybody. in college yeah the best thing I was saying is is funny I, I got DW I, I ended up getting a DW deal um, and I got a this new finish they had which was now everywhere but it was the white marine pearl and it was like a didn't was Max a, have that too yes, but it was brand new for him and I had this kit and so when I rolled out with the kit he totally was like this smarmy bitchy like oh nice kit like rolling his eyes at me like I was like copying his thing like I didn't know I didn't care it was pretty funny Everybody that I know who's gone on that show, you know, all the drummers went in and wanted to befriend Max, and then most of them had a kind of prickly response. Well, I, I yeah, that happened because of the drum set, and I was so green, I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was worried about playing a gig, you know, terrified. It was one of my first TV shows, but so I could care less. But I went back a couple times to either play with other bands or to watch friends of mine play, and I watched him during the thing, and he was just screaming at the guitarist or somebody in the band or at you know production for not toweling him off. Or It was just like, all right, dude. <laughs> and he was a nobody, 
Bruce wasn't working, and the story goes like, he literally, like Conan goes up to like, is waiting in a car, it's pouring rain. This is a story I heard, I could be wrong. And he goes up to use an ATM, and, and it's like pouring rain in New York. And he walks up to the ATM, and he looks over, and it's Max Weinberg. And he's like, you're Max Weinberg? He's like, yeah, what about it? I'm a huge Springsteen fan. I'm starting a TV show. Literally, this dialogue happened at like an ATM in the pouring rain. And he gave him his number, and that's how he brought like Max Weinberg back. Well, I had heard that Max had gone back to school to become an accountant after Bruce broke up the band. Yeah. And that, that was around that time. Yeah. And he's met him at an ATM. And huh. Yeah. So he was kind of like, you know. It ended up being an ATM for Max. <laughs> you bet it did. You bet it did. God bless him. Hey, man, God bless him. I mean, it's all good. All fine and dandy, you know. But so, yeah, so that happened. So that was a huge deal. And that only lasted for a little while. You um, and Juliana. Yeah, Juliana kind of went nuts. Um, she went crazy halfway through the run. And the, basically the management called me and said, you know. Her, what do you mean she went crazy? She yeah. kind of went nuts. She like checked out like crazy town. Like crazy. Like too much pressure. You and, bet. Yeah. Yeah. She tried to make a record that was like, sounded like Nirvana and everybody wanted like, happy Juliana, the cover of Seventeen Magazine. What happened to her? She cut her hair all weird. And, I don't know, man. She tried to be artsy and she tried to be Kurt Cobain. And little girls were like, we don't want that. We don't want that music either. We want that record before. Mm -hmm. This was supposed to be her big record. She tried to go artsy too soon. I don't know. I don't care. You know, I was just playing drums, but it taught me the business of the business soon. Like, yeah, this is great. And then it wasn't. And basically her manager called me and said, you know, her psychiatrist or doctor said she's got to go back to her original band for normalcy. Okay, cool. What's that mean for me? You get a week you get two weeks severance. At that time, I was making like seriously like 500 bucks. I'd left grad school and I just bought a, like a $3,000 drum set with an endorsement. And that was harsh, you know, that was harsh. And, but the cool thing is when I got to town, a buddy of mine picked me in the car, put in a tape of this band, this guy named John Dragon. He had a little four track band. He played everything named Jack Drag. He was like, you should be playing in this band. I know you're going to big tour bus tour with Juliana, but you should be playing with this guy. So when that went south, like, before you know it, I'm playing with John Dragonetti, and we're waking music, and we're hitting it off, and this band Jack Drag, and next thing you know, we have a publishing deal with Sony for a lot of money, and we have a record deal with, like, Corded in, in When LA. you say we have a publishing deal, were you writing songs? I wasn't writing songs, but we got a publishing deal as a band. John got the publishing deal. We all got cuts of it, you know? So next thing you know, I'm, I don't have to work, you know? In that publishing deal, John cut it out, so we all had salaries, you know? Um, was I writing some parts of it? Sure, but no, John was the main writer. It was his baby. I was fine with that, you know? I never wanted to be but a But that was smart man. of him then, he, he could, because he could have kept it all to himself, well, he and kept, then yeah. he wouldn't have had the loyalty of the exactly. band. And that's same with the record deal. When the record deal came out, we each got, you know, then he was able to keep more publishing, and then we got paid from the record deal. And we were recorded by three labels who were flown out. Dudes were coming to shows. It was exciting. It was like, I got to have my cake and eat it too. I got a taste of doing a tour bus tour, first out of the gates, playing TV shows in London on The Word and Conan O'Brien and doing cool shows with her and cred right out of the gates. And then all of a sudden, I got to have my, I got to have my other side of the thing, which I always wanted, which was have my own baby, my own band that we nurture. You know, and it kind of sounded like Beck. You can check out Jack Dragon. There's a record called Dope Box, came out in AM. It's pretty pretty proud of it if you listen to it now, did you John's, get to meet herb elpert no i wish i did jerry but, moss no but i did hang with um the dude who signed us was one of the most um famous esteemed he signed the doors he signed frank zappa he's very famous he flew to new york to see our band and signed us and we got a big flossy record deal we made a record at sunset sound the old boom days yeah and, oh yeah this is 1997 and i came out and i finished my tracks in like a week and uh, it was like, well, what do I do now? And I'm like, well, you see, you have that extra rental car. The, the engineer was like, that road is Santa Monica. And if you take that road all the way down, it'll end up at the beach. And I had a couple cassettes. It had tape player. It was a car. And I've led Zeppelin live at the Forum, like two nights. Someone had given me a bootleg. And I literally popped that in, and I drove around California for, the, for another month while they made the record and ate great food, went to the beach and said, I'm moving here. Regardless of what happens with this band, this is where I was always meant to be. And in my heart, I always knew I was meant to be here. It's funny, I saw the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood Tarantino movie. I just saw it yesterday, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's amazing, and it's like kind of my life in a weird way, you know, of like the actor who kind of has, kind of shows up, and like you're like times where you're like, what am I doing with my life? You know, what is my career, where am I at? I, you reach a plateau, and then they, sometimes you're like, it's that constant second guessing, and yeah. he's fine in the end, and not to give away the movie, but but just the general, just like well, the the movie, my read on it, it was you know he was kind of having 
this crisis of becoming irrelevant. Well, that, have think, you ever felt that oh, way? Absolutely, and I think you do all the time until at one point you turn around. I think at the end of the movie you start to feel like he's kind of cool. Like the girl love, digs him, the neighbors dig him. The point is, is he comes to terms with like this is okay. You don't have to be on top the whole time, right? And I think that the, anybody. <clears throat> You know, when you really want to get into the psych psychology of this business, because I've started from nothing. I moved out here. I knew no one. So I did move out here to finish that chapter. After Boston, the band was around. We, we toured all over for like two years. The record label, we got dropped, but the record came out. You can still find it in Amoeba. Satisfied. I moved to L.A. knowing no one. No one. But it turned out I knew everyone. Once I saw Babco, once I saw Luke Adams, who I went to North Texas, once I saw Dave Gibbs was out here living with Adam Duritz from the Counting Crows, Boom, next thing you know, I'm playing ping pong with Adam Duritz at his mansion, and I'm hanging with Luke Adams and this whole North Texas crew and playing with Jeff Babco and the whole Miami contingent. You know what I mean? Once again, college kind of came in. But you go through these phases where, like, you know, nothing matters, and you're just going to throw it against the wall and do everything you can, and all of a sudden you start getting gigs, and you start getting more gigs, and then all of a sudden the stakes are higher, and stakes get even higher, and you're like, oh shit. And then you start second guessing yourself. Like, am I good enough to be in this gig? When I'm flown over to play with Japan with the bees, I start getting this psych psychosis of like, oh, you know, oh my God, like, I'm the only gaijin here. There's 50 people with one of the biggest guitars who are playing Budokan, and I'm the only dude flown in, and they're paying to stay in a hotel. And, and I'm like, How, do I deserve to be here? And you start psychoanalyzing your playing and your, your worth. Because it's okay when it's near nothing, but once you start becoming, you know, getting gigs and become, the stakes get higher, you can start to second guess yourself. And I think that's where he was at as well. But then also, at the, at one point, you turn a corner and go, wait a minute, no, I'm cool. Like I've got this body of work. You know, I don't have to worry about what that guy thinks of me, or if I ever get another job. And then it, it makes you sit back. There's a, there's an arc. I think a lot of people go through it and some people don't. I think Aaron Sterling, I think, had a podcast where he talks about it. everything was cool. And then all of a sudden he was like, oh, my God, what am I doing here when he had all these great sessions? And I guess at this point, you know, I'm at a point where I'm completely at, at one with that. I've made it over that arc. And I feel like at the end of that movie, that's kind of where he was, where you know, I'm cool, you know. But it feels, um, it's an interesting that's a whole psychology. And some people have it differently. Some people are just cocksure of themselves the whole time. It's like, high five, dude. You know, I wish I could be you. But I think if you're really giving a shit and paying attention. Do you, though? Do what? you really want to be one of those people? No, no. I mean, but, you know, I'm happy being me. I'm so happy being what I've done. But, no, but some people, yeah, I think they have this kind of, this built-in shell where they just naturally don't have that, they don't have that reset button that makes them go, oh, shit. Were you? I think that's a good thing too. I think it makes you reassess what you're doing, and it makes you take risks, and it makes you get out of your comfort zone, which is something I talk about a lot. When people say, "How do you do all these different gigs?" I get out of my comfort zone. I've been getting out of my comfort zone the whole time and saying yes to everything to the point where there is no comfort zone anymore. Do you still say yes to everything? I say yes to everything th that, for, for the most part, if it's cool, I don't go downtown to play some goofy bar gig anymore because I, 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 I not because I'm too cool for it, but because I know. 50 other drummers who are like 25 or 30 that should be playing that gig. You with me? Mm -hmm. I don't need to make 80 bucks. They do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when I see older cats like trying to like scarf out like gigs, it's chill, dude. You've got the resume, man. Chill. That kid could use that session for 200 bucks and you don't need it. So just because you're used to working all the time and that work isn't coming to you like it used to, you're doing just fine still working. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm working fine with Cher. I've got two and a half months off. I'm not coming here to work. I don't need to go gig right now. I'm cool. And I've got investments in real estate and Airbnb, you know, money coming in from these rentals I have. I don't need to go do that. I'd rather see a 25 or 30-year-old kid do that gig because he needs that. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. I don't Are mean you... to sound like charity or something, but that's yeah. how I feel. I don't need to be doing those gigs. He does. Does that make sense? One thing that I find interesting about your career is that lots of people would think of a band like the New York Dolls and then a band like Smash Mouth as like polar opposites right. as far as their um, kind of vibe and MO, mm. you know? But you've done it all. You've, you've done s stuff that's extremely pop and then you've worked with these subversive bands like New York Dolls, although, you know, they had become established by then, but even Not still. really. They were still punk rock as hell. Yeah. I mean, it was the shit that, you know, they were still no different, man. It was pretty pretty ballsy. It was pretty awesome. They were a gang, even at 60. They were like, 
you know, some manager come in and be like, hey, you guys are great, man. I manage Def Leppard and Jones. be like, yeah, it's fucking great, man. Let's talk about it later. We're about to go on, though. Do you mind getting out of the dressing room? Close the door on him. Mm -hmm. It's like, holy shit. That dude just basically shut the door on a dude who was offering the whole summer of touring with Def Leppard. Because mm -hmm. he couldn't give a shit. Because mm -hmm. he's David Johansson. Mm -hmm. He's the real deal. You know what I mean? It's like some real serious shit. But he's a sweetheart. He's a, a doll. They're just the greatest guys. You know, so great. And then you've also played with Foreigner and then also Marilyn Manson, mm -hmm. you know, which brand, they, branding yeah. wise, they're, they're very different, totally. but, but is there a common thread creatively through that weaves throughout all the groups that well, you've played music. with? it's great music. Yeah. It's great music. I don't care. Even Smash Mouth, the production on that record, the, the songwriting on the Smash Mouth records are brilliant, you know? Um, so to me, as long as the music's great, yeah, I got to deal with a front man who's an alcoholic or I got to deal with a dude who's, you know you have to deal with personalities you know that's the hardest thing is i think a lot of young drummers or just drummers in general don't realize like every time being a freelance artist like this going from those extremes it's like you know i, I used this analogy recently but it's like meeting the parents every time i have to meet a new manager a new tour manager i have to meet their girlfriends their wives is more to it than just playing in the band and adjusting to the music you have to adjust to a whole new way of doing things i've worked with probably 50 managers you know 60 tour managers you know, met, I can't count how many wives and girlfriends and kids. It's like a whole world. And you have to be able to show up there just like Japan and be like, okay, this is how this works. Read the room. It's just as much, per rather than the band, say, like Jim Riley, who plays in the Rascal Flats, he probably has known one, maybe two tour managers for 20 years. You know what I'm saying? It's a different thing. And I, I, to, to, to be fair, I don't know that I could do that. To do, be in the same band for 20 years, I don't know that I could do that. But I know that what I've done is exactly what I set out to do, what I wanted to do. I never wanted to be in Lincoln Park. I, you know, Jack Drag, I wanted to be in my own band, but I never wanted to stay with that band. You know what I mean? I wanted to do all this. I wanted to get to play with Cher. Because like, I liken it to, like, at North Texas, we developed all these skills. They trained us to, to kill a hundred ways. You know what I mean? And I got to use all those skill sets. And that's why I feel I like that's kind of rare these days. It's very there's rare. not uh, m there's not as many musicians that function that way because of the way the music industry has shifted. Absolutely, absolutely. It's like when you know there's a very rare, um, and and also part of my thing was not just to also be like a character actor. Unlike say, and this is no discredit, but someone like Kenny Aronoff, if Kenny Aronoff plays with the Smashing Pumpkins, he's Kenny Aronoff. If Kenny Aronoff plays with Melissa Etheridge, he's Kenny Aronoff. He's always Kenny Aronoff. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be me, but I'm going to change to the music like a character actor would. I'm going to uh, develop a British accent. Or uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to study what the drummer was doing before me. And I don't, I don't mean to discredit Kenny, but when Kenny plays, he plays the same for almost all those gigs. So you're, you're more in interested way. in being, say, a uh, Gary Oldman than a Steve Buscemi. Exactly. Yeah. Or, yeah, absolutely. I'd rather kind of... You know, because when they start, when, my goal is, and I've had it happen in a bunch of auditions from doing the homework, from studying the drummers before them. Maybe I always have my own spin on it, but I'll be playing, and when the singer turns around and is like, it, I, I know this sounds weird, but it sounds like we've, it feels like we've been playing together for like ever. Yeah, okay, mission accomplished. You know what I mean? I want them to just know, I want to do enough research to when we're playing together, they don't feel any different than the guy they were playing with before, and then eventually I can kind of put my spin on it. And nothing against Kenny. Because I love Kenny's playing and I love Kenny. But he's, and that's a beautiful thing. I don't think in this day you can just come in and be Kenny anymore. I mean, he can, but I have to kind of blend a little bit. When I'm playing with Foreigner, hit a little lighter, tune the drums a little lower, you change it up. And I'm sure, I'm saying session guys like Kenny will do that too. But I'm, I'm saying generally he is who he is. You're, he was able to do that and establish that and market that and brand that. I kind of, you know, I've tried to do it a little slightly different, you know, and obviously like in Chris Cornell, Honor, Brad Wilk, when we play Audio Slave, Honor, Matt Cameron, but put a little bit of my own spin on it. But you gotta play Spoonman the way he played it. And you gotta play the Phil and Black Old Sun the way he played it. And you gotta play the Phil at the end of Cold as Ice the way he played it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or else, what are you doing there? You know what I mean? So, so, so tell me a little bit about your current gig with Cher. Well, How did I will that say come about? It's the coolest gig I've ever had. And they're all, like I said, I'm pretty stoked with everything I've done. I love those bands still. She's the coolest gig because I've always been a fan of her since I was a little boy. Um, yeah, I, her show was probably on when you were yeah, a kid. Yeah, it was kick-ass. And the band was always kick-ass. And whenever she had anything you ever heard, it was great drummers. It was Jeff Percaro in her live gigs. It was 
Hal Blaine on the records. It's like quality shit. When you hear Half Breed, you're like, yeah, it's, those toms sound great. It's a drummer's music. And she had composers writing her music, so there's lots of like five bars and seven phrases and weird shit. Because, you know, it was cool. And it still is cool, you know? When you put on Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves, it's sexy, you know? And it's sexy when we play it, you know? Still, it's saucy, it's raw. And that, that, that might be a, a thread with all the bands I play with too. There's also a, re a realness to those bands. They're edgy. They're the real deal. It's, it's edgy, you know? From Foreigner to Manson to Cher, to, you know, to Smash Mouth. It's, it's edgy in a way, the way these guys approach it. You know, they're kind of all kind of doing it for the right reasons, you know? But yeah, so to play that, play that gig, it's, it's the most strenuous gig I've ever had to do, mentally, um, all to a click, you know? Uh, yeah, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just fantastic to get to play that music and that diversity, you know, to really, to really raise the bar. And I feel like playing with Cher after all these years of all these gigs I've done, it's prepared me to be ready to play all those styles authentically if I can help it, you know? Whereas, and the way I got the gig is Mark Schulman, who I'm a huge fan of. I've been a fan of Mark's, who is able to, someone like I aspire to be, like a, like a Tommy Aldridge or a, you know, the drummers who play with all these different bands, but they always kind of had their own little signature, their own vibe. And Shulman, Mark Shulman, you know, I was, it was a bizarre situation, but he called me out of the blue. Um, the way I got the gig with, or the way I kind of passed the test with Mark is I was doing a, a month-long clinic tour in Europe. And it was like a music mesa, kind of summer Nam German thing. And among other things, I was playing a brush demo. And Shulman saw it and was like, I know this dude can rock and can hit hard, but I need to, because he knew that the share gig was going to have conflicts with Pink. So he reaches out to me because we had stayed in touch. We had met at a Christmas party the year before talking about real estate and design. Interior when design. you say conflicts with Pink, you were playing with Pink at the no, time? No, he was. Or he, he, was, was. he had okay. been playing with Pink and Cher kind of on and off, same I management, gotcha. but they had never come close to having a tour together. And now <laughs> it was coming close, so he was going to do some share, and there was potential that Pink might start up early. So he reached out to me, and we, we talked about getting coffee, and, he, and he, I, he said, hey, let's get coffee. It was right after that clinic. We sat down, and he said, um, dude, I saw this brush thing, and I've been looking for a guy, and I know I can find dudes who can rock, or who can play light and jazzy and read, and you know, have, have play styles and, and be dynamic, but I need somebody who can like, play like Dave Grohl, like through the drum. You know? And he's like, I don't know a lot of guys who could do both. And he's like, I, I knew you could do the rock, but I saw you play this brush thing, and it was like, I think that's my dude. And then he, we reached out and he's like, are you my guy? And I was like, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. And we ended up talking and he was like, well, um, I got to do this pink thing. Uh, if that happens, you know, could you, you want to learn this? You want to do share? And I was like, dude, give me the music. I'll learn it all. And if we can do it um, together, great. And if not, I, it was a great study in learning her music. And he was like, you're my guy. And so a few months later, uh, we ended up, I ended up calling him again in January. Um, and they were in rehearsals. And he said, hey, why don't you come down? We'll have a coffee. I said, let's get a coffee again. We wanted to. Uh, we, we, we left it in November that we would get a coffee and reconvene. So I reached out and said, hey, let's get that coffee. And I think a lot of drummers don't realize it. But when someone like that says to you, I'm interested in you, you need to follow up to let them know that they're actually, you're actually seriously interested in some way. So that, in a weird way, I was kind of doing that, but I didn't know I was doing that when I called him. I really just wanted to meet him for a coffee. He said, I'm rehearsing with, with Cher, come down, meet the music director, meet the band, and we'll have coffee. These guys are coffee nuts. So I went down there, Eva Gardner's on bass, and Eva's a great friend of mine. I walk in and she's kind of cold. And I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, hey, what's up, girl? And she's just like, hey, man. And uh, I end up meeting the whole band, and Mark's like, why don't you pop on the headphones and you can listen to the tracks while we'll run through the show. You can hear it. I was like, great, I'd love to. They set up a drum throne. I meet Gary Grimm, drum tech to the stars, Percaro, Gad, you name it. Um, and he hooks me up. I meet everybody. And afterwards, we have a couple of coffees, you know, shoot the shit. I talk to everybody. We open the door at SIR and we have a good time. And I split. And I wondered why she was being so cold. And it turned out, you know, I talked to Mark a few months, like a month later, I was going out with Dee Snyder for the summer, just doing like, arena uh festivals europe festivals opening for aerosmith and and he said you got the gig like you're gonna need to and i was like what he was like yeah that was your audition the fact that you called me back showed that you gave a shit the fact that you meant came down and met the band 
you know, me and Eva vouch for you as a player. They dug your vibe and you passed the test. So you're going to go do share and I'm going to go do pink and the gig's basically going to be yours because I'm going to then go after this giant pink tour. I'm going to try to focus on doing my inspirational speaking and things. And so there you go. So it's just kind of one of those weird things. You would never expect a gig would come to your way that way. That said, that's exactly how I want to get gigs from now on. I don't want to have to go fight it out with 20 dudes or, you know what I mean? It's nice to get a call from somebody that you respect and say, hey, here you go. Well, at a certain point, you know, there's a certain level of player that can get any gig at this point. So right. it's, it's really more about the personality there's behind it. it. There's plenty of great players, of is what I was trying to say. Sure. <laughs> Especially, like I said, from the guys from North Texas, like those dudes all have this chops. So well, and every like, year there's, you know, 10 more people dude, from North Texas. and not to, yeah, not to mention, like, the younger generation. Yeah. Those kids are coming out of, like, high school, like, fully baked, fully cooked, because they can go online, they can study, they can get all these lessons online. It doesn't matter if you're from, you know, the middle of, like, Minneapolis, Minnesota, or you're from the South Florida. You're coming to the place with almost, they all have the same information at their at their, at their axis by the time they're hitting the ground. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's, these kids are ninjas, you know, they're all, you know, they've all got these great resources and they all sound incredible. You know, it's, it's a new generation for sure. You know? So earlier you mentioned that you have investments and you have real estate mm -hmm. and uh, I know that you have your realtor's license too. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved in that stuff? And have you always been a business minded person? I don't think it's that as much as honestly, I just, I like, I bought a house, you know, when I was young um, with <clears throat> money I'd made from a few record dates, you know, in LA, in the Valley. I still have it. I bought it 16 years ago and I, I bought it, I had roommates, you know, I, but it was scary, but I, I knew I always, I think I've always looked like 10, 20 years out. It's just how I am. My father, that's just how I am. So I, I realized that you needed a certain amount of stability. You know, rent control wasn't going to do it for me, knowing that I got to stick it out in this business with its highs and lows. What's the best way for me to, like, brace myself to keep this career going? And I thought, you know, I got to have a house in L.A., and things are going to go up, and I want to be stable. So I bought that place. Once I did, I realized, wow, this is fascinating. Most people don't know anything about this. I didn't. But I like it. I dig it. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to get my real estate license so I can learn more about this. I helped my mother buy a house next door, and I was renting it. And I thought, well, I'll learn her laws as a renter, too, and that would all come as a realtor. So on the back of a tour bus with American Hi-Fi, I studied real estate and took college courses. And then well, at the end of the tour, I got my real estate license, and I sold six houses my first year. Wow. It was a, it was a red hot year. It was 2005, and the market Right was before ready. the crash. Exactly. <laughs> that said... Everybody I sold a house to who kept their house, their house has tripled, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, out here. Anybody who sold during that crash maybe isn't, you know, yeah. took a few hits. So it's a happy ending. But And since then, I've sold another, like, four houses, you know what I mean? But I haven't really sold. I didn't sell for, like, eight, nine years because of the crash and because my career took off, you know? So I didn't really care about it. It was like, yeah, okay, whatever. But I was fascinated. I kept my license current. Every four years, you have to keep, you have to do a further education and pay and take exams, and I did that. So that was fun. And I, for me now, I really, the goal is I consult people all the time, like helping them buy houses. I don't even get commissions on half of it. I help people buy houses in Portland, Oregon, or, or Nashville. Or, Did you help uh, Elitch buy his house in Portland? Let's just say, <laughs> yeah, I helped kind of kickstart that. You know, it's, you know, Dave's a smart guy. And Dave, you know, I love what I love about Dave, like myself, is he, he sees the value of collecting art, you know? And he could buy a Ferrari, even though he has a couple dope cars. He chose to invest in art and I've helped him with some art deals too and I think that's great you know if I could help anyone like that but with Dave it's more a matter of I could say yes and I'm sure he would agree and we talk on the phone all the time when we have real estate questions like hey because he does Airbnb too and I do Airbnb and I've been doing it for like four years in Nashville with three rentals so I guess I'd like to say like I help consult him you know I'm not saying he did everything I told him to do but uh, he did he you know it's cool and I'm proud of him and I'm proud of all my other buddies who I either have helped consult buy a house or they just bought one on their own it's like yeah cool I'm glad I could if I could help with a little you know get, hooking you up with a lender or explaining what this an amortized mortgage means <laughs> you know what I mean because a lot of people don't know it's scary but it's easier I than feel like they should teach every high school kid absolutely the basics of real estate or just the basic of business. You yeah. Know? What is a stock? What is a bond? It's all, it's all, I guess, you know, gets, gets taught that rich people when they're young, their grandfathers sit them on their lap, rich people, not your average bear and especially not musicians. Nobody teaches them anything. What's an amortization. I'm telling people who are 36 years old, sitting them down and saying, this is how this loan works. Wow. 
It's like, how the hell do we not know that? How, why do we study trigonometry? What a joke. Well, the, it's Stupid. not mutually exclusive. I mean, I, I think trigonometry sets up your brain so that you can understand amateurization. I agree, but I'm just better. saying trigonometry but, is, is a higher level where yeah. you could be studying other things or applying it to yeah, real estate. Exactly. But not only that, I mean, I have Frank Briggs, who's an amazing drummer from the drum school. He, we joke about it. He said, you know, the personalities alone, you should study that in music school. I think you should also study psychology. Yeah. You know, learning how these brains work. When oh, I man. say I have to deal with personalities, I don't think any drummer knows half the crazy shit I have to deal with by all these different personalities, you know, in these different gigs. Well, I compose music for TV and films. You know. And this year alone, I've worked with, you know, I've worked on about 10 different projects. With each of those projects, you're dealing with different personalities, different egos, um, different sensibilities. And what I've kind of come to learn over the years is that the communication aspect of what I'm doing is... Essential. It's more important than the musical aspect. You just nailed it. Communication. I was about to say that word. And even if you watch that Quentin Tarantino movie, look at all the nut jobs and characters that, that, that Rick Dalton has to deal with in a day. Or You know what I mean? Like, that's what you deal with from the Al Pacino to the Kurt Russell. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like, that's our life. Like, it's real. <laughs> and those personalities, have, being able to negotiate a contract without talking about money, without making a manager, making a manager feel like he's getting the good deal. You know what I mean? That shit takes a while, and no one teaches you any of that. I have a lecture I do at some colleges. I go out, and I have a whole thing, breaking into a scene. The questions that I ask myself that no one tells you in college, and they still don't, the information that would be vital. You know, Every college should have someone who's out there doing it come in and discuss it with the students. Like You don't need to see another cat come in and play burning jazz. Okay, great, but spend also the same amount of money bringing in dudes who are saying, I'm on the front lines. You're in boot camp. If you want to survive on those front lines, this is what you need to know, at least right now. That'll change in a week, but at least right now, this is what you need to know, right? Mm-hmm. Yet they'll pay tons of money to have guys come in and play and get like killer players to come play at a recital for the college, but they never bring in somebody to come in who's like a session guy. I would have loved to have Gary Malibur come in and be like, you know, it was actually, it happened at Miami. They brought in to play with the orchestra, but it was uh, Bruce Hornsby who went to Miami as well. And was playing with the dead at the time. And Bruce came in and it was just like, and John Molo came with him. And they were like, it was, it was a breath of holy shit. This is reality. When they spoke, they spoke to me about what was really happening out there. And it was a speaking of words that no one had ever talked about in music school. And it was a lot of fuck this and fuck that and this bullshit and like street. But it was like, wow, this is, this is vital information. Or I remember Sonny Emery once coming in and doing a, a clinic, and he talked about he, had, he was in the thick of it, working with all these bands, and the shit that came out of his mouth was incredibly uh, saying, hey, man, you better practice now, because when you get out there, you're going to have a mortgage, you're going to have a wife, you're going to have a baby, you're not going to have time to practice anymore, dudes. This is reality. Well, let me ask you this. If you were to go back and talk to your 18-year-old self or your 20-year-old self at UNT, and you were to give the kind of lecture that you actually wanted or needed at that time, what would the topic be? What would you tell these kids? I would tell them all the things I tell the kids now. And I, I'll do lectures. I, I did one, at, I've done them at Syracuse University and different places for the, because now there's a huge music business program, right? Because nobody, that's all these colleges have because there is no, no one goes there to be a jazz major anymore. Like seriously, no. No one goes there to be anything that has to be a player. No, they go there to study music business. Because it's the only job. Air quotes. I'll, I'll let everyone know yeah, that you just did quotes. air quotes. But they're everywhere now because that's really where the action is. Publishing, you know, uh, management, l- um, lawyer, you know, that's where people get these general degrees and then they can kind of negotiate. Sure, you can still play, but you're, if you're going to get a degree, that's what you're going to get. Most people are not going to get a performance degree. Those days are over. You know what I mean? Um, so I do lectures for those and I go in and I talk about topics like where do you start? And that topic is breaking into a scene. And I have like 20 bullet points. And then I tell real life stories about how I, you know, how I would recommend to my 18 year old self to break into a scene, which means like, you know, where do I start? Where do you go? And when you get there, how do you get into that atmosphere? How do you get into that environment? Um, I'll talk about auditions. How do you prepare mentally and physically for an audition? I'll talk about managing yourself, YouTube's business cards or a a website, how do you make it so somebody can press a button and see you in a positive light? Because you only get like two seconds, right? That's it. 
you know, Marilyn Manson, I told this story earlier to an interview, but Marilyn Manson got hip to me. Somebody was like, who was this guy who's going to come in and audition? And the bass player was like, oh, he's actually a really good session drummer. Here's, and he showed him a bunch of, and one was a, me playing a snare drum solo called Rudimental. It's gotten a bunch of hits. It was kind of a one-off with a buddy who was also from Potsdam named DeKale, who's a big director. And he was like, hey, I got a camera. Let's do something. Well, I'm working on this snare solo I do in clinics. Cool, let's film it. Manson saw that. And that broke the ice. He was like, wow, that's cool. When I met him at the audition, which could have been very awkward, he was like, hey, what's up, Mr. Magic Hands? I just saw that thing. It was really impressive. I dug it. It's cool. I've never seen anybody do that before, especially like a rock drummer. I would never in a million years think that that would have broken the ice to get me the, you know, in with Marilyn Manson, right? Same thing with brushes. Brushes is what got me the gig with Cher. Think about that, right? It's pretty crazy, right? So those are things I would tell someone. Make sure, don't be afraid to show your skills. Even if they're, especially if they're outside the box, because it might set you aside. And also, it's I got into that because it got me out of my comfort zone, which is a word I use a lot. You know, don't be afraid to go down that dark hole because that will prepare you to, when you have an audition that's very uncomfortable to be comfortable. And eventually, the more you're out of your comfort zone, there is no such thing as a comfort zone. It's all the same. Does that make sense? If you audition for something and you don't get it, do you feel disappointed? Not anymore. Not anymore, not at all. In fact, I'm like, cool, man. How could I? Because the gods, I joke about it, but I, I mean it. The gods, the drum gods, have been looking down on me my whole life. You know. So to me, it's like I could never, ever, and this is you know, just kind of an esoteric, but the big picture, as I call it, the drum gods, I could never blame them for not letting me have a gig at this point. Does that make sense? But do you blame yourself? No. Yeah. No, no. The, I, when I go to auditions, and, yeah. and this is a big point, and that's something I can say to younger players or anybody who's maybe <laughs> gigging or struggling. I don't get a lot of gigs, and I find that when I talk about the gigs I don't get and why I don't get them, or gigs I get and then I, the, you know, I get fired or the, they choose another drummer or they bring somebody else back, when I tell those stories, those turn out to be the most inspirational stories to drummers because nobody ever talks about that shit. And to me, I think it's healthy when you, hear, when you watch the hired gun and you hear Liberty DeVito talk about when they got fired from Billy Joel and how their lives came crashing down. It's like, boo who? You had 30 years with one of the hugest rock artists in the world and lived a beautiful life and never had a bump? Like, dude, that, you, that's, you should be jumping for joy and be thanking the rock gods. This, you know, we as, as session drummers or hired guns, really hired guns, he was a side man. That, that should be clarified too. He's a side man to Billy Joel. He's not a hired gun. A hired gun to me is someone who works, you know, a couple months or a year. But once you start working for a few years, you know, I'm now a, a side man for Cher. I was a side man for Chris Cornell, right? Mm -hmm. I was a hired gun for Tak Matsumoto, and I was a hired gun for D. Snyder, right? I was a hired gun for Joe Perry. The difference is you, you take your lumps, and I think you have to embrace those lumps, and you build a thick skin. And then you can actually, once again, when you go into audition, be you, and not worry about making somebody right. happy. That's the only way to do it as far as I'm concerned. Because if you go in and you play what you're uniquely qualified to play and you don't get the job, it just it's like being on a date with somebody that you're not compatible exactly. with. It's fine. It's better than faking it and getting the gig and, and then winding up with the wrong group of people. Absolutely. But to tie in on that, my goal is to get every gig and to be able to, like a character actor, I want to convince them that I'm British. You know what I'm saying? I want to convince them that I grew up in Scotland or whatever. You know what I mean? I want to go in, and even if I'm not that guy, I want to be able to fool them into thinking I'm the right guy because it's, it's a challenge. But I will say at this point, I go into auditions, and I've been like that for about the last five years, where I'm auditioning for myself if that makes sense. I don't care what anyone in the room thinks of me. I don't care what the manager thinks of me. I don't care what the guitarist wife thinks of me. All I can do, because the only thing I can control is what do I think about myself? And I feel like my bar is pretty high from doing this. If I leave that audition, I went, it's a great example, I went to audition for Beck. And I busted my ass. I was teaching some music camp right when I get the call. So I'm like booked every day teaching this music camp. And I have this Beck audition coming up and I'm trying to practice late at night. And Luckily, I know Jason Faulkner, Roger Manning. I play with Faulkner. I know Roger Manning in the band. And so I show up at this audition, and I'm sure it's like, who's who? You know, this is a couple years ago. And I go in, and I auditioned, and, and it was like concert toms, and there was like a SPDS X to be like, in the middle of the breakdowns. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to 
I could not play that. They're like, you don't have to play it. I was like, no, I'm going to play it. Where's the, where's the explosions? Where are the hand claps? Cool. Remember. And I played those things and I nailed the shit. And I left the audition. And sure enough, Chris Coleman gets the gig. Well, Chris Coleman's going to get the gig. Then I'm not going to get the gig. I wasn't the right guy. The audition went well. I had a great chat with Beck. We played all the tunes. We'd finish a tune. Beck would spin around and Faulkner would be like, hell yeah. And I was like, hell yeah. This feels good. I'm making music with these guys. We're communicating. I'm pushing. I'm pulling. We're making music. I may not be the right guy. And I knew I may not be the right guy going in. And sure enough, when Chris Coleman gets the gig, if you're looking for Chris Coleman, you're not looking for me. That's okay. But I left the audition satisfied. And when you're playing in Vegas with Cher... Do you still have the same feeling that you had when you were 11 years old Absolutely. playing at dances? Absolutely. Has it ever gone away? Never. Never will. No, I still give a shit. Just like Matt, my cousin, he's still gaga over the new snare drum from Ludwig or whatever. I love that about him. He's and a giant dork. Yeah, he's a giant dork. <laughs> but, but we all are. And I yeah. think there's something about that. Like I'm still excited when I get a new Paiste symbol in the mail and I'm like, yeah, man, I can't wait to play this. And I run down like a little kid. Um, I still practice you know, every other day. I'll probably go play drums tonight and have fun with it, but I don't have to worry about a gig. You know what I, mean? I don't have to worry about something, and I don't have any feeling of like pressure of like, God, I wish I could do this, or ooh, I wish I had his gig. I don't, re- I don't look at anyone with envy anymore. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm completely 100% at this point. Now, granted, the drum gods may say, that's it, needle off the record, share ends, and you're done. And I would have to be cool with that. I'd have to be cool with that because they have rewarded me. I have been rewarded. All that work, all that lack of sleep, all those sacrifices have been 100% worth it. You know what I mean? When I sit in my backyard in LA and, you know, just like, I just look at my, my world and I'm like, I'm so lucky. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, again, like that movie, you know? It's like, I'm living that world. I live in a beautiful place driving down here. It's like, yeah, there's traffic. It's Friday. It sucks, but I love LA. And I'm driving and I'm just like, the air is beautiful. The palm trees are, you know, I, it's an incredible place. I feel like honored to be, not to, just to live here, but to be a part of it. You know what I mean? Well, Jason Sutter, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, man. The Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. <laughs>